The Holy Gospel according to St. John. Then Jesus said to the Judeans who had believed in him, If you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will make you free. They answered him, We are descendants of Abraham and have never been slaves to anyone. What do you mean by saying you will be made free? Jesus answered them, Very truly I tell you, Everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not have a permanent place in the household. The son has a place there forever. So if the son makes you free, you will be free indeed. The Gospel of the Lord. I'm delighted you're here. This is a special day for me and for Sarah and for our Synod. Thank you to the people of Trinity and Grand Rapids. Thank you all for being here. A mighty fortress is our God, we Lutherans life love to sing. God is our refuge and strength, the psalmist declares. And as Luther did in his day, so we do in ours. We apply and interpret the psalm so it fits the church of our time and its struggles. And so when we sing, a mighty fortress is our God, we know what we mean. A mighty fortress is our God. And it doesn't take long to get to a mighty fortress is our church. Especially since we are children of the Reformation and can claim for ourselves shaking the church to its foundation. Look what we did in 1517, we say, when Luther posted the 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg, questioning abuses in the sale of indulgences. We reformed the church. Yay, us! That is so often the sentiment of our Reformation Day festivals. But when the service is over, it's pretty much been there, done that, when it comes to church-shaking Reformation. Truth be told, we just assume the church not change especially in the ways we don't want the church to change, especially in the ways that direct change of the church will affect me directly. A mighty fortress is our God, we sing. A mighty fortress is our church, we pray. And who could blame us when the world outside is changing so much. Confronted by the complexities and the uncertainties of life, who could blame us for yearning that the church be a safe and a stable and a secure place? The psalmist writes, we shall not fear Though the earth be moved, though the earth should change, that the mountains should shake in the heart of the sea. And so, when it comes to the mighty fortress of the church, we draw the bridge, we lock the gates, 
We hide away behind stained glass walls. And to keep our fear at bay, we sing, A mighty fortress is our God. There are some problems with locking ourselves away in a fortress, even the fortress of the church. First, eventually we starve to death. Removed from the world, the bread of life that is God's word goes stale, and the fount of living water runs dry. Removed from the world, eventually we starve to death. The second problem, of course, is that locked away from the world, we miss that the siege is over. We've locked ourselves away because our faith is under siege. Our church is under siege. Maybe even our God is under siege. And so safe in the fortress, we miss it when maybe the enemy is defeated. Or maybe the enemy gets bored and just goes away. And so the, uh, there we are, locked in our fortress, fighting a battle that no longer exists. And so we say, as Lutherans, we are not medieval Catholics. <laughs> Amen. But the main problem with locking ourselves away in the fortress of our God, the fortress of our church, is if we are looking for absolute safety and security and stability in this life, then a mighty fortress ain't our God. If we are looking for absolute safety and security and stability in this life, then a mighty fortress ain't our God. Though they should take our spouse, we sing. Good, uh, goods honor. Though they should take our house, we think, sing. Goods honor, child or spouse. Should life be wrenched away. That does not sound safe or secure or stable to me. Jesus says, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples. If we continue in God's word, we are truly God's disciples, Jesus' disciples, because Jesus' words, word always leads to danger and to uncertainty and to vulnerability, yes, and even to death. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, Jesus says, will draw all people to myself. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, Jesus says, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. New life, yes, but not without death. Heard the only thing we need to do to be raised by Christ is die. That's as true for the church as it is for the individual Christian. It's always been true. It was true for Jesus who went to the cross. It was true for the early Christians when Paul decided to share the gospel with the Gentiles. And at the time of the Reformation, it was true for Luther and for Pope Leo. The church that they knew, the church that they loved, was gone. My friends, I think we live in a time when it's true for us as well. And I fear that our 
reaction is to resist change. Jesus Christ, yesterday, today, and forever, could be our mission statement. We've always done it that way, Bishop, which means we've been doing it that way for as long as somebody my age remembers. We spin our wheels, we spend our lives protecting and maintaining our fortress. But I suspect we live in a time, my friends, when the church is changing, and I think we all know it. But today I say to you that while the church we know the church we love is dying. As surely as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, so the church, and especially the church in this synod, is being raised to new life. And so we look to God to raise the church. because it is still true. A mighty fortress is our God. Which begs the question then, what kind of a fortress is our God? The psalmist gives us a clue. There is a river whose streams make glad the house of God, the habitation of the Most High. God lives in their midst. And God will help the city when morning comes. Revelation makes the picture even better. The city has high walls and 12 gates. At each gate there is an angel. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel are inscribed on each gate, and at each gate there is a fountain with the names of one of the apostles. The gates, of that, the gates are never shut during the day, and there is no night. The people bring the honor and the glory of the nations in. First Peter gives us a different picture. picture. But you as living stones, are being built into a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, who make offerings, spiritual offerings, pleasing to God through Jesus Christ. A river flowing, a city with gates, 12 gates, God's people being built into a spiritual house, none of it our doing, all being done by God in Christ Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. Sounds to me like these are biblical pictures of our Lutheran understanding of salvation. Paul writes, for we, are, we hold that a person is justified by faith, apart from works of law. I've boiled it down to two words in my life. Radical grace. Radical grace. I wonder what would happen if the church in this synod became a place where anyone, where everyone, experienced radical grace. I suspect that for ha that to happen, the Holy Spirit needs to remodel our fortress. You see, the world needs us to lower the bridge. The world needs us to open the gates. 
world needs us to knock out some walls and to build more gates. And the only way we're going to do that is by the Holy, power of the Holy Spirit. We need the Holy Spirit to remodel our church. As Lutherans, we call the Holy Spirit's remodeling Reformation. And we celebrate it today. Where's Sarah? That's a question I've learned to ask in the last 20 days. <laughs> Where's Sarah? Sarah, we have called you to assist. Assist is such an interesting word. <laughs> I imagine there's going to be some pleading and provoking and pestering and pandering and pushing involved, especially when the bishop doesn't want to change. Pastor Sarah, we have called you to assist me. We have called you to assist us to embrace the Spirit's remodeling by lowering the bridge opening the gate and knocking out walls to build more gates. We rejoice in your faithfulness. We give thanks for your commitment. We rely on your humor. Sarah, you've been at this 20 days. I've been at this 57. And I think there's one thing we've learned. We have no idea what's coming next. <laughs> Except that I promise you this. I wasn't going to cry. <laughs> A mighty fortress is our God, mighty enough to remodel and reform Christ's church into the church that Christ would have us be. So my friend, we begin. And so we begin. Amen. Amen.